Welcome to Harlow on Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. Today, my guest is Jan Fleuro, CEO of Cardiologues, which has developed an AI platform for analyzing electrocardiograms, has obtained FDA clearance, and the roughly parallel CE mark in the EU. Jan was educated in Paris and at Berkeley and now splits his time between Paris and Boston. Welcome, Jan, and thanks for joining us. Hi, David. Thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. Certainly. So, Jan, I know that you're passionate about the potential for innovation at this intersection of clinical practice and new technologies. And I wonder if you could share with us some of your thoughts about how artificial intelligence may be incorporated into healthcare. But before you do, I'd like to ask you to define artificial intelligence. What do you mean when you use that term? Well, you know, artificial intelligence is a relatively broad term. It takes its origins uh, in the mid-1950s. And I would say originally was considered to try, I mean, all the sorts of technologies and techniques that were meant to try to reproduce, to reproduce the human intelligence. Well, somehow over the last few decades, I would say the field has uh, split it between different types of categories from knowledge modeling, machine learning, computer vision, language processing, and so on. And so now you have a lot of different disciplines uh, that all actually um, make artificial intelligence. And one of the categories with most traction recently is machine learning, and in particular, deep learning technology, uh, a set of uh, a subset of machine learning that relies on, on deep neural network that was originally developed for uh, computer vision applications, but which has shown to be uh, actually widely applicable across many different areas. Of, uh, of technology and artificial intelligence. And so now, I would say through the learning component of artificial intelligence, many advances has been accomplished in computer vision, language processing, uh, speech processing, and, and so and so. And so what we do at, at Cardiologues uh, is relatively specific. We apply machine learning technology to electrophysiological data, to, uh, I mean, in, in cardiology, so electrocardiogram data. I understand that you have a particular set of services that are out in the field or being used clinically. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about how that came to be and how you see sort of the evolution of use of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Sure. So in the specific case of cardiologues, so we have taken as, as a starting point um, a diagnostic modality, which is the electrocardiogram which is the examination that measures the electrical activity of the heart. And actually, the electrocardiogram enables caregivers to detect up to 100 different cardiac disorders. But in most of the cases, um, its analysis remains labor-intensive for experts and, uh, and a real challenge for, uh, for non-experts, for non-cardiologists. And when we started Cardiologues a few years ago, we observed that the state of the art in technology was relying on relatively old technology paradigm and that the state of the art in machine learning and in particular in computer vision actually enabled the creation of a, of a technology that could reach expert level performance, provided that, that this machine learning technology was trained on enough data. So we gathered a data set um, which now counts more than 2 million different types of recordings. We have developed machine learning technology. We have showed uh, and published that um, we have reached expert level performance. So our technology is currently able to detect more than 100 different heart conditions based on electrocardiogram data. But from a product and from a business perspective, we focus on, on a relatively limited uh, number of indications, which are um, arrhythmias. So in short, an arrhythmia is an abnormal uh, heart, uh, heart rhythm by, by definition. And so the clinical case, I mean, the clinical story is the following. The patient story is the following. The patient suffers from either a syncope or a stroke or palpitations. The patient is sent to the emergency department and, I mean, one way or another gets referred to, uh, to a cardiologist. And while being in the office of the cardiologist, 
all the examinations are relatively uh, normal. And so the clinical assumption is that the patient is suffering from um, episodical arrhythmias, which means that you have uh, and, uh, your, your heart rhythm that comes and goes in very limited uh, time frame. And so the examination, which is then performed, is an ambulatory electrocardiogram, which means that your heart rhythm, uh, your electrocardiogram, is recorded from typically 24 hours up to 30 days, and actually in certain cases, up to a few years through implantable, uh, implantable electrocardiograms. And so all the data generated by these devices actually puts a burden on caregivers because, there were, as I said in, in introduction, there is no real satisfactory technology to automatically process electrocardiogram data that, that, that was available on the market. So we productized our algorithm into a complete online software that enables caregivers to streamline arrhythmia diagnostics. So what we have on the market right now, it's a SaaS solution, which is FDA cleared and CE marked for uh, arrhythmia diagnostics. And that enables cardiologists or caregivers in general, because it's not only cardiologists that proceed to this examination. Um, we enable them to, to perform the diagnostics uh, five times faster than with the traditional software. So I assume you see the AI tools that you're making available as a means to allow clinicians to practice at the top of their license rather than to replace clinicians, as is sometimes suggested by folks who are maybe afraid of technology. But how do you see this interplay between AI and clinicians working out in an ideal world? And is your goal to move this capability and expertise from an urban or academic setting to to broader clinical settings? Or, or is there something else at work here, what you're trying to do? Well, our product is well is already used about 5,000 times uh, on a monthly basis just for arrhythmia diagnostics. So we are already used relatively uh, broadly. So we are really outside. Uh, but as for, I would say, the future relationship between, between technology and, and doctors, well, I, I think that the question is not so much are we going to replace or not the doctors. The key question is what does the patient need? And so in some the geographies of the world, in the United States, I think there are 32,000 cardiologists in the United States, which is a pretty sizable number. So it doesn't really make sense to completely replace them if it doesn't enable to radically improve uh, the clinical service, which is delivered to the, to the doctor. So in other terms, in the US, our current product is meant to drive efficiencies, cost reduction, and therefore enable shorter diagnostic times and, and cost efficiencies for the health system as a whole. While in other countries, such as India or South Africa, they don't really think in terms of, is AI going to replace the cardiologist? Because th there is no cardiologist in the first place uh, available. So in, in these geographies, the impact of the technology and, and of the same product will be radically different because in that case, it will enable patients to get access to a new type of diagnostics that wasn't widely available before. So I, I think when we, when we consider the evolution of the relationship between AI and, and the doctors, I say the, the key underlying consideration is how is AI moving the needle in clinical practice in terms of patient care and how does that translate uh, very specifically per clinical indication and per geography. And, and that's really the difference between, I would say, the technology and the productization of, um, of the technology. Now, if we think, think further, I don't know, decades, I mean, in a, few, in a few decades where I would say AI, I mean, which is meant to, uh, to perform exponentially better, I think there is a real case, which is not to say how AI will replace the doctor, but how will the role of the physician evolve in the next few decades? Right. There's really an, an opportunity for a transformation of the role yep. of the physician. And I guess one of the many questions that comes to mind is, what are the hurdles, what are the barriers to greater adoption of AI, greater acceptance of AI in the space in order to enable that sort of transformation? Yeah. I mean, is, is there really two things? There is, how are we going to increase adoption of AI in the world as it is today, and how is AI going to change the world, and in particular, how, how doctors practice medicine? As for the first question, how can we 
that would accelerate the adoption of AI? Well, there are three, usually three steps in any medical innovation, regulatory approval, adoption by the caregiver community, and monetization. I mean, these are the three you know, natural, natural steps. As for the regulatory barriers, I mean, many companies now uh, have managed to, uh, to bring products to markets, cardiologues, but also I mean, many, many others. As for adoption by the caregivers, there's a few companies, I mean, also like, like cardiologues that now you know, are used in clinical routine. And, and there was a very good paper from The Lancet a few weeks ago about that matter that the key for broader adoption by the caregiver community is clinical evidence. And now, even if many different types of AI technologies have made it through the regulatory barrier, the body of evidence remains relatively light for many reasons. The first one being because it takes time to, uh, to clinically validate technologies. Also because a lot of, I would say, clinical research or clinical publications or princeps publications have been performed by uh, clinical research teams, uh, such as you know, Stanford University that, that published many great papers uh, into nature. But the purpose of these teams is not to, to bring a product to, to mainstream clinical adoption. So I think we're going to observe a lag between uh, I would say the scientific proof of concept publication that show the potential of AI and the proper clinical validation of AI, because they will be conducted by two different types of entities. And that is really the next step, proper clinical validation. And for that matter, AI is no exception as a technology. I mean, uh, when it comes to clinical practice, to demonstrating benefits of a technology, I mean, be it AI, be it a valve, be it, I don't know, any, any other type of hardware or software, um, the endpoint remains the same. How does that innovation improve outcomes, reduce costs, or bring more uh, revenues and more activities to, uh, to the caregivers? And so... We are now, I would say, getting to, to the stage where uh, this, this will come from. If you're just tuning in, this is Harlow on Healthcare, coming to you on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm David Harlow, and my guest today is Jan Fleureau of Cardiologues. And just to, to complete the answer, as for the second, uh, the second question, which is, how is AI on the long term going to transform I mean, the way medicine is practiced? I think there is a real, I would say there are two paradigms that are changing in medicine today. For decades, or even for centuries, the social role of of the doctor and their status was built upon knowledge and somehow analysis capacity, as well as humanities. Now, uh, what we see is that through information technology in general, the access to knowledge uh, in medicine is getting uh, more and more uh, available. Uh, that's the first thing. And, and the speed at which medical knowledge evolves has never been faster. Um, that's, I would say, the health IT part of medicine, which is, which is digitized. Now with AI, what we see is that also the analysis component of the job is getting more and more I mean, commoditized. And so there is a real question, which is on which basis we, will we build um, the training and what makes uh, the caregivers of the future? And, um, and I have... A couple of thoughts um, about it. W- one is that the main difference between um, between uh, a doctor and um, an, an algorithm, or I would say an AI-enabled product, is that even if they both speak the same language, which is you know evidence-based medicine, statistics, um, the doctor really cares about the individual. A doctor is in charge of an individual patient, while the AI algorithms now have been built basically to mine data through, you know, huge data sets at the population uh, level. So there is one line or one axis in which we could define the future role of of the doctor will be against all the recommendations, against uh, all the power that technology could reach, um, the doctor as a person could be the person in the chain in the future who has the right to go against the technology, to go against the recommendation of the AI, because that is that is their social role in the, in the chain. And I think that's, that is a role that we will need, and that is a role that can only embodied by definition by, uh, by a human. And as for second uh, say access, it would be, uh, would be around empathy. Uh, we, we must never forget that 
there are many, many, many decisions in medicine. I mean, be, be, being a doctor isn't being just a, you know, a technician, right? You don't get to a doctor just because, you know, they have the right knowledge and, and, and the right diagnostic power. Medicine, being, being a doctor, is way more than that. Because there are many questions in medicine that do not have the right answer. If you take the case of a, a couple of parents whose daughter is in a terminal stage of a cancer and, and many different types of treatments and options have been considered and tested uh, unsuccessfully. And, and the father you know, asks the doctor, um, what would you do, doctor, if, if that was your daughter? Well, there isn't a good answer or a bad answer. There isn't a score that, that would answer accurately or appropriately to, to that question. The real thing is that what the patients and what, what the family are, are looking for is for the social acceptance of the decisions that can only be, be given by another human. That, that's the definition, of, the definition of empathy and the definition of our kind as a, as a social species. And I think that it's broadly applicable to all the different types of AI application, from healthcare to justice as well. Jan, we're talking about trust in artificial intelligence and the mediation of technology by human clinicians and the, the human element, the human factor, the empathy that's necessary in order for medicine to continue to be practiced. Part of the toolkit, the AI-enabled algorithms that are, form a part of the core of what you're doing, what others are doing, is based in a sense on a black box. And I'm wondering how we can engender trust in something that can effectively be a black box. And related to that, how you've encountered working with the regulatory agencies and sort of what is their interest from your perspective in peering around the black box? Or are they satisfied with the fact that the algorithm as originally presented, you know, I assume is proven to do as good or better than a human read of the tests. And the question is, what happens as the algorithm continues to change based on new information? How do the regulators look at that? How do clinicians think about that? How do patients look at that from a perspective of trust? So there are two, two really different questions here. There is a question around the black box effect and, and around the evolution of, of the algorithm. Um, I, I will first ask to the, to the second question because it, it's the most straightforward. You know, as for the process of evolution, our software is regulated as a medical device, which means that all our developments are documented, uh, are controlled by regulatory bodies on a, on a regular basis. I mean, we are audited multiple times a year um, per year on all our processes, and in particular, the development process. And so the update process is just, I mean, so to speak, another process, which is meant to be uh, to be audited and on which a risk analysis is documented and performed. The key question is the cadence. Uh, I mean, what, what is the cadence of, of the uh, update? And, and what is the, how do you control every, uh, how do you manage the risk on every single uh, uh, upgrade? And so when it comes to continuous improvement, most people think about systems that are improving online which means that as a product it is used, it is continuously upgrading, which is not the case um, of I mean most of the uh, most of the machine learning based solutions available on the internet, and not just in healthcare. Also, also applies to uh, online advertising and so on. Most actually of the update process is done offline, which means that um, all the R and D work. Uh, is done, all the testing of the new versions of the algorithms are performed offline, which means that the data that comes from our customers and from our users continuously um, goes through a safe harbor where it is audited, annotated, uh, curated, if you like, uh, before getting to feed the new algorithm. And when a new version of the algorithm is developed, it is tested against the other. And, um, and if it passes a certain number of tests, it goes into production. And so the fact of being offline and having all the tests actually mitigates the risk pretty well. And, uh, and then it's a matter of the cadence at which you manage to implement that process. And are you able to discuss what the cadence is for, uh, for you in terms of 
updates or reviews? Yeah, I, I think we are one of the most advanced companies in, in the world to that matter because our product is, uh, we have a new release of the whole product, which means the algorithm, the UI, and so on, every 27 days on average. And we are used across uh, four continents, including two different regulatory environments, the CE mark and the FDA, which means that every 27 days, uh, we developed, I mean, we design, we develop, we test, we release uh, a new version, which is compatible with both um, the regulatory uh, constraint uh, in the US and in, in the EU. And our product is used to diagnose heart disease conditions. So from a regulatory perspective, we're class two, which is special controls. And so that pace of release, to our knowledge, is one of the uh, of the fastest in the uh, in the industry for that level of um, of risk uh, for uh, for our product. And actually, all the audits we ever had in the history of the company actually um, were very very good. Uh, and the key is really uh, risk analysis and documentation. I would say the black box effect is not specific to AI. It can be applied to other uh, other types of technologies. So the the key underlying question behind the black box effect is the relationship between uh, correlation and, and causality in the different model. And how can you explain uh, through causal mechanisms the correlations that you uh, that you observe between your inputs and your outputs? And uh, and that's right. I mean, the, the deep neural networks are a type of machine learning models, which are statistical tools, which do not allow to easily see what the algorithm is looking at. Even if, I mean, first, there are techniques the deep neural network that enable us to have an idea about where does the algorithm look at. And, uh, but the whole point, which is interesting, is that there are already many, many different types of technologies used across different industries which are very sensitive for which we do not really have the complete causal model. If you look into the details, we do not really, really know deeply how a certain types of drugs work. Typically, the anticoagulation therapy for patients with atrial fibrillation, we observe that when we put patients under anticoagulation, patients with atrial fibrillation have a lower risk of stroke. But uh, because a clinical assumption is that a blood clot is getting created in the atrium when the patient is in atrial fibrillation and then sent to, to, the, to the brain. But we never managed to observe that clot which means that even if we have an idea of the causation relationship, and if we have evidence on correlation, the causality has never been uh, demonstrated yet. Same for one of the most widely used drugs uh, in the United States and in Europe, which are statins. The causality model for statins is still relatively unknown. And even if I had to, to get to an, an even broader prototype, even if we have the Navier-Stokes model, the exact causality mechanism that makes a plane fly isn't deeply uh, deeply ex explained yet. And that there was a famous post by uh, Yann Lequin, one of the fathers of AI, I mean, answering about uh, causality that took this, uh, as an example that struck me. When we take a plane, when we take statins, we somehow also rely on the black box effect. It's just that our experience with these different types of technologies, planes, drugs, has been validated by so many different experiments and by models that enable us to get an idea which is relatively close to what, how we think it works, that we uh, consider it satisfactory. But the complete causality mechanism isn't, uh, wasn't uh, full. Well, I don't know whether to, to thank you or not. You've sort of wrapped all of my belief in science in a package that really sums up as a, as a leap of faith if we don't know the, the reasons for some of these things. But yeah, I appreciate your putting some color on this. Jan, to wrap up today, I wanted to ask you one final question, which is if you were to wake up tomorrow and find yourself five years in the future, what is one thing about healthcare that you would hope or maybe expect to find has changed dramatically? Well, uh, I would really say the whole uh, product services or the whole procurement model from, from the industry in general. When we meet with investors, in particular investors that do not come from medtech, a lot of them have, they have the following um, 
rational for investing in, in medicine. Software is eating the world. You know, many industries have been digitized, e-commerce, taxi, and so on. And so now that we see that healthcare is getting increasingly digitized, we believe there is a huge opportunity for software. And they are right, but not necessarily for the right reason. In all the industries, what internet has brought is a new customer acquisition channel, which means that through the Amazon, consumers have started to pay for goods and services online. Through Uber, customers have started paying for uh, and purchasing taxi services online. And what we see right now is that even if healthcare is getting increasingly digitized, the procurement process, the behavior of, of the consumers of the medical products and services has not changed. You still need a complex, very qualified sales force on the field. And so that, that's the main difference between what is happening right now between the digitization of healthcare and, uh, and what happened in other industries. The internet revolution has not come yet to medicine. It is digitization and not proper internet revolution. So I really hope uh, that in a few years, we will have found a way to bring that internet revolution to, uh, to healthcare. Because by decreasing the complexity and the customer acquisition cost, it will radically change the speed at which innovation is brought to the market and, uh, and the cost for, uh, for the system. Well, that's a compelling vision of increased pace of change in healthcare. Thank you, Jan, for joining us. Thank you very much, David. You've been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com. Let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time.